Hey everybody, this is Dr. Javay and I'd like to welcome you to our third episode of Latte Talk with Dr. Javay. Uh, this is a special uh, draft edition, Goat Dolphins, and um, we have a very, very special guest today. Uh, this is going to be a lot of dental stuff. So I know uh, a lot of people that are following or watching this video are non-dental. It'll still be very, very interesting, but uh, this is mostly for dentists and dental students or new graduates, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my special guest is Dr. John Cranham, who is one of my mentors and I met a long time ago, um, and I have uh, learned so much stuff from him. Uh, we both went to the same school. He is the clinical director for the Dawson Academy. So you're going to hear and learn so much about the Dawson Academy today, uh, which is wonderful. And I want to say I will be interviewing uh, other people from other dental institutions and uh, I will be promoting them just the same way. We're all in this together in regards to dentistry. We're all trying to get better. We're all trying to teach each other. And this is what it's all about. So today is all about Dawson Academy and uh, they're, they're incredible, incredible institution here in uh, St. Pete and all over the country with lectures and everything that's going on. Um, so it is going to be exciting and it's going to be a great talk. How do I know that? Because I just got done interviewing him. <laughs> so I know it's going to be good. So um, thank you for watching and have yourself a great day. Again, stay positive, stay cool, stay handsome. That's important and uh, and stay driven and stay educated and stay good all things good baby <laughs> all right have a great day bye i like you following my rules you have to have a latte to be on latte you told me i got my lake cup here you know it's like <laughs> i have my uh, tim hortons cup from uh, oh tim hortons from canada my wife's canadian so we go visit yeah. uh, in-laws I was born in Canada, so I'm a huge Tim Hortons fan. I, oh, my gosh. Double the I, caffeine, man. It's like rocket fuel, man. Well, the, pro the thing is, I think they put some kind of medicine or something in there. <laughs> I think it's like, it's like crack or something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyhow, it's such a pleasure having you. And I really, really appreciate your time and doing this. I'm, I'm really, really honored. Um, just a little note, and I and I I, uh, I know you're the clinical director for the Dawson Academy, and um, and you can tell me more, please, uh, as as we go along. But yeah, right, yeah. and um, I I recall uh, I, I recall MCV, and as you know, we we both went there, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing how things have changed over the years. When I go back uh, to visit, and uh, it's just crazy. <laughs> it's it's not, nothing well, looks the same. Like downtown Richmond, you know, all the dorms, all that stuff is gone. It's yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, thanks for the opportunity. I wanted to talk about different aspects of, of dentistry. And I, first of all, I want to I get, get into how did you get involved in dentistry? How did you get involved in education? Okay. And then we'll get into the other, other stuff as well. Yeah, so it's really kind of a weird story. I didn't have a, anybody in a family member that was in the medical field. And I grew up born in Canada, raised in Michigan. And I worked uh, as a young guy uh, at a little inland yacht club. I was the only employee. I taught the sailing and cut the grass and, you know, painted the little clubhouse. There was no restaurant or anything. It was just a very simple place. And I loved the dentist there. I, I can't really tell you that the lawyers are all stressed out at the docks. I pulled off the lake when their beepers went off and the dentists just seemed to have these great lives. And I also liked to fly fish, tied my own flies mm. and I sold them. I would s tie all winter and, and a lot of those dentists were my clients. And one of the dentists commented one day that if I could tie flies like this, I'd be a hell of a dentist. And that's how it got in, it got in my head. And they also seem to have a lot of time to fish. So, so that was the other, <laughs> the, the other part of it. But when I got to dental school, um, I had a relationship with a dentist that was part-time named Baxter Perkinson. And my mom had just moved to Virginia and needed a full mouth reconstruction. And when I was between my junior and senior year, he told me he would help me do it, but I had to read a book. And he gave me Dr. Dawson's book, the first one, the, the kind of the gold one. Yep. And he used to come on Tuesday nights occasionally and lecture to us. And, um, but I restored my mom's mouth and 
that guy had such an impact on me. And then of course I went to see Dr. Dawson right out of dental school and it just sort of lit a fire and it wasn't, it was, I think what got me interested in it is I love the documentation. I love taking the photos. I love learning at a really high level, but I wanted, I definitely wanted to make people feel like Dr. Dawson, Dr. Perkins had made me feel that there was mm -hmm. hope and possibilities and it just was so inspiring. And so that's kind of what got me going. Uh, and then, you know, when I got, a, I went through Dr. Dawson's first uh, series there, he just had three classes then. And I was fortunate that um, I, he kind of took a, a notice in me and invited me into a little study club that he had. There was basically 19 doctors that were all kind of what I would call seasoned Dawson practices at the time. And he wanted to start up and I had just bought my practice and I got invited to that group and we met quarterly for, you know, for five years. And he was studying, sounds crazy, but he was studying happiness and fulfillment levels and he was studying productivity levels. And so we were utilizing a software program again, which was unheard of at the time, but he was mm -hmm. looking at analytics and that's really what got me. I think it took, it launched me because I was around some really fine dentists early. But what got me teaching was um, shortly after that, after going through Dawson, the aesthetic revolution was hitting hard at the time. And it's amazing when you think about it because cosmetic dentistry and, and like occlusion-based dentistry was diametrically opposed. It was like the occlusion guys weren't really thinking adhesion worked and the adhesive guys thought the occlusion guys are a bunch of old, you know, has-beens. Mm -hmm. And I, I went and saw, you know, Dickerson and Hornbrook and Trinkner and all those guys at the time, Rosenthal, Nash. And I realized that there was a void. And, and I thought, well, I'm going to do that kind of dentistry on Dr. Dawson's Principles of Occlusion. And I developed a course called the Cosmetic Occlusal Connection, which I think you heard back in the day. And that's what got it going. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I was one of the first people that sort of integrated those concepts. And of course, now everybody, you know, it's, you can't do beautiful dentistry without having some understanding of occlusion. Yes. Just a quick story on Dr. Dawson as well. And I really want to get into that if, if, if you don't mind. Um, Dr. Dawson, of course, this goes without saying, I mean, he's been such an inspiration to so many dentists. So when I was first starting, I was an associate and the owner said, you know, we got to get you some Dawson courses. I was a young dentist and I went to, and I went up and um, just a great course. It was just eye opening. You know, it's the first time you just don't hear things like this. And, uh, and at the end I was just, uh, just graduate and I went up to him and I asked a question and they say there are no dumb questions. I think I asked the dumbest question and he was so humble. He was so nice and he was, he explained it just one-on-one -on -one and he wouldn't mm -hmm. stop until I completely understand the concept. And one thing, and I honestly, I, I see that in you as well. You had some um, courses that you came to West Palm Beach and you had a bunch of stuff, uh, mounted casts for treatment planning. And that was my thing. I said, I wish somebody would sit down and show me how to treat and plan cases. And, and you did that. And, Truly, I really believe this definition of a mentor, and I really want to want you to get into this and give me some examples of the, the Dawson. I know you had a close relationship with him. I think true definition of a mentor is somebody, it's not just somebody that teaches you something or it's not something that you learn from somebody. It's somebody that really wants you to succeed. Yeah. I, I somebody, really, somebody who loves you, man. I mean, exactly. That, yeah, yeah, that's I, right. I, I, I really see that in him. I see that in you. And after also, I was taking a course from uh, Dr. Fenley, Dr. Scott Fenley in AACD. And I could tell he really wants us to succeed. And, and it's part of, it's definitely part of our culture. And it, it comes from Dr. Dawson. There isn't any question about it. And you're also going to find very, you know, one of the things that, about him that just amazed, uh, consistently amazed me was, you know, he's arguably one of the most famous dentists on the planet in terms of just how long he's been doing it. I mean, he was an active educator for 65 years for Pete's sake, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. the textbooks and the videos and all that stuff. And, you know, when we were the keynotes at the AACD, like in 
2012, I think, and when it was in DC. And it was really cool because my daughter, who's in her last year of dental school now, at the time was a senior in high school. Mm-hmm. And she was with me and we were walking through the Gaylord and, and, and Pete was with us. And of course, everybody's heads snapping because they're realizing it's Dr. Dawson. And, um, and he's just so humble. You know, he just didn't mm-hmm. really know. And we went to the little Iva Clark get together. And the guy's like, you know, we get in there and they have the name badges and the guy goes, oh, Dr. Dawson, you know, you don't need a name badge. He goes, oh, no, no, I absolutely do. And he stuck his little, little Pete, you know, he had to have his name badge because <laughs> he didn't want to be different, you know. And so that night I said to him, I, we were at dinner and the, the, my, well, my daughter and his granddaughter had walked away. And I said, Pete, I said, you know, I got to ask you something. He goes, uh, I said, how do you deal with the fame? Like, how do you deal with it? Like, how do you stay so humble? And he looks around the room. We're at this really nice restaurant in DC. And he goes, is it, does anybody around here recognize me? And I go, no. And he goes, John, there's no famous dentist. The sooner you get through that, through your head, the better off we'll all be. (laughs) (laughs) And so, you know, I just, so I just always kind of went through it. What I realized was, what drives him is not was not fame or any of that stuff. He just loved Dennis. He mm-hmm. loved Dennis, and he was so concerned about kind of dentistry that there's so much procedural stuff happening um, in dentistry right now that, with regards to aesthetics and occlusion or uh, implants and and like procedural things that you have to learn, that there's not an, as much time to devote to really understanding how the joints, muscles, and teeth work together and. And so he was just so passionate to make sure that people understood that pretty much anything we do fundamentally, even down to a simple restoration, we have to learn to manage force. And that's what he devoted his life to. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, you know, it's fun for me to, to adhere to the basic principles. You know, dentistry has evolved. We're talking about, you know, DSD and, and all the digital, cool digital things. We're doing st- tons of stuff with three shape. All that stuff is really, really cool, but joints, muscles, and teeth aren't going to change, right? right? I mean, they're all, they're all going to work the same. And, and again, I, you know, and I, what we were talking about earlier, it's so true when you hear our seminar one for the first time, which, you know, he put together, it's eye opening because you learn that this is a system and what you realize is if you can understand how the system works and you can get it to work with you rather than against you, your life as a dentist is a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, one question that I have, and, and from someone who is practicing, and I know you have a beautiful practice in uh, Chesapeake, and uh, somebody who is uh, educating people Right now, it's really tough. It's really tough for everybody. It's really tough for young graduates. And I know, you know, personally speaking, I irritate my wife because I cannot wait for Mondays. I I just can't wait to come to work. It just, I just have so much fun. And the more I learn, the more I learn, first of all, the more I realize how much I don't know. And uh, it's a cliche, but it, but it, but it's true. But if you had an advice for a young dentist, uh, a young graduate or, or dental student, I know you said you have a daughter in senior dental school right now. Um, what, what, it, what few advices would it be, would you give? Well, the first thing is I, it is been eye opening because I, uh, my daughter, Caitlin is a senior. And so I've spent a lot of time with obviously her, but also a lot of her friends at the university of Louisville and before that, I spent time at, at VCU. So I'm acutely aware of the number, uh, the basic number that a lot of these young people are coming out with. And, you know, when we got out, I, I owed about $130,000 coming out in 1988, and I had to pay it back in 10 years. And back then, the loans were, you know, 17 to 18%. So I had to borrow the whole way. And that, that was a big number back then. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I'm, I'm, aware, I'm aware of it to some degree. Uh, I do think now it's maybe a little bit scarier, but here's what I would say is that, that what you have to understand at the, is that this is absolutely a marathon. It's not a sprint. And so if you come out and you are so focused on trying to just make money to pay the debt and keep your head down and just work, 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 
you know, when you get out of dental school, you're just basically have the fundamental basics of how to do dentistry and maximum cuspation and kind of single teeth and maybe a three unit bridge and, and it and you've got to keep learning. I mean, you've got to commit to that. And, and again, you know, you're a great example of talking about your excitement and you even said straight up, what gets you excited is the fact that you're learning. And mm -hmm. the dentists that I see, they're the absolute happiest and have the most passion for dentistry are the ones that keep reinventing themselves. Uh, I started to place implants about three or four years ago mm -hmm. and I, I planned them all and work with great specialists. And I don't do them all, but you know, if, if you look at my eye watch the day that I'm putting in implants, you know, I look at the end of the day and I'm like, oh, it's about 150, about two o'clock this afternoon, you know, so, so, but, you know, getting out there on the edge a little bit. And that's one of the greatest things about dentistry is there's always things to learn. Now, yep. Yep. having said all that, be cautious of just learning different procedures. You, you do have to base yourself on some fundamentals and Certainly uh, at the academy, we have the way to do that. There's other places where you can learn to, to learn a systematic approach to, to handling more complex things. Mm -hmm. But understand leaving dental school, you pretty much have just trained to learn in maximum cuspation when the occlusion is kind of okay. But when you get out, you're going to realize there's people with wear and te teeth that are drifting and broken teeth. And sometimes you can't work with where the person is at. And so you have to develop workflows in your practice where you first recognize what's basically wrong with the person and then have a protocol in place to be able to handle it. And I think if you do that, the key is in, in, in being happy and, and successful and having enough money to pay your loans and having enough all, uh, is, is just having predictability in your life protocols that lead to predictability and if you don't have that and it sounds boring but if you learn to do a b c d e f g all the way through it your life is so easy it becomes very easy and you know i i, I joke you know 32 years in i guess right now you know i, I feel like i'm just figuring this out you know what i mean <laughs> and, and so you know what I mean? I, mean yeah, I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. And exactly like what you said, the more we learn, the more passionate we become. And I've realized the doctors that are not happy in what they're doing are the ones that are taking the courses online or not going there and not hands-on. And uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of sad to see that because we have such an exciting profession. Um, and speaking of excitement, tell me, tell me a little bit about, uh, to me, the best thing about dentistry is the relationships we make with patients and the lives that we change. Tell me some of the examples that the lives that you've changed with your patients and how they are transformed. And it's amazing how they, they become part of your family. If yeah. you can give me a couple of examples of those, you know, because this yeah, is the first thing that I, yeah, the first thing that I would say is that, you know, what's so cool about a general practice and we're 30 years in now, you know, I'm taking care of kids, you know, kids are coming into my office where I took the primary teeth out on them, you know, so, yeah. you know, we're on, and that sort of third generation of some of these families. But so that's sort of the general side, and, and I love that part of it. But when we start doing dentistry to handle some of the more specialty problems and more complex things, um, certainly there's just been so many veneer patients, um, cosmetically driven type people. I can think of one gal whose mouth was just sort of bombed out and her bringing in her picture from her wedding day, you know, mm -hmm. and, and telling me how she felt you know mm -hmm. and how it would have been different for her if if she on her wedding night you know and, and per, really kind of personal stuff but yeah. that's the kind of stuff that just kind of makes the hair stand up on your neck and <laughs> and now you know the number of people that i've seen that we've done the all on four all on five where the mouths are just bombed out and yeah. and they just look like a train wreck where they come in and you know a few years later they've got their kind of cool hairstyle and leather jacket you know some of the guys that we've seen and 
And so, you know, I, it just kind of goes on and on. And then, and then the number of TMJ patients that, you know, were really close to suicide mm-hmm. that we've been able to el- eliminate the pain. And so what I want, you know, people to sort of f- realize is that you can develop these niches in your practice where you can, you can do best in the world stuff, whether it's aesthetics or implants. And I don't even think you need it all, but I, I do think one of the most important things about a general dentist is first have that, you know, enjoy that general practice. I, and I miss that for a long time. It, for a long time, I felt like if I was doing a DO on a bicuspid that I was like a loser or something, you know, but, <laughs> but you know, if you have a general practice and hygienist, you, you're going to have nuts and bolts things to do. And that's cool. You know, I, I look at it as a little break now. Yeah. Um, but there isn't any question that when you start doing the more advanced things, uh, that's the stuff that is, um, there just isn't, an, I mean, there isn't any amount of money that sort of plants that feeling of, of doing something for somebody that does alter their life for their, yeah. forever. Yeah. And that's really, really cool. It does. And it's not, it's really, I can't compare it to anything else. It's just, we're so blessed. And I I say this to be able to um, do stuff like this. One of the great advices that you gave me one time, and I I still remember, uh, was to get together with our specialist and have a study club with the specialist and talk about the case. And it's so important to get the uh, the orthodontist. Perry let Donald. me do it. Let me do a shameless plug, if you will. So we just I, created. I wish you would. <laughs> we just created a podcast called the Go To Dentist Podcast, and I actually just recorded it yesterday. And that, and it's the third one we've done, but it's actually on creating the interdisciplinary team. So we talk mm-hmm. for about twenty-five minutes exactly how we organized that and scheduled it, and um, and it it is important. And and again, you know there isn't any question the trend is more towards doing more procedures in your general practice. And that's great. But I do think we have to recognize our limits and know when we need help. And, yes. and then when we need that help, those people have to be on the same page with us. They have to share the same philosophies and can execute the treatment uh, in a way where you being the quarterback have control of it. So Excellent. Um, one last thing, and I know you're busy and I, and, and I really enjoy your courses and I do watch them. Um, my last question is, um, you know, right now it's tough. Right now we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how we're going to return to work. There's a lot of unpredictable things, but at the same time, there's a lot of predictable things. We are going to go back to work and we're going we're gonna to do this stuff and we need to continue to educate ourselves. But in general, um, my final question is, where do you see our profession in the future with all the stuff that's going on regarding um, dentistry, regarding the business of dentistry and all of that? Where do you see dentistry in the future? Well, let me just say two things about that. So the first thing is, and I go back to Dr. Dawson, but one of the things that he always drilled into my head is, if we do the right things for the right th- the reasons, things will turn out okay. We'll have enough. We'll, the, the money sort of will follow that. And I, and I think we have to keep that in mind as we come back. Keep doing the right things for the right reasons. Um, the other thing he would say when I'd be stressed out about something, he would say, and this too will pass. You know, the, the wisdom of somebody that in his late 80s that just had seen so many scary times come and this is going to pass there's any question now we may have different ppes we may have different guidelines we don't know exactly what that is but i still think this is the best time ever to be a dentist and and the reason is is you look at the baby boomer population aging this is the first population that does not want to live life without teeth. So if they're losing their teeth, they want implants. Mm -hmm. They care about how they look, so they want their smiles to look good. We know more about occlusion and function than we've ever known. We have the best materials at any time in history, and we have the best trained laboratories and technology to go with this. So, So, but I do think this, I do think that the dentists that succeed in the future are going to be the dentists that can solve problems that most people can't Mm -hmm. because the problems are just getting more complex. And I think sadly, a lot of the, the, um, the industry is rushing towards sort of volume 
and I would be, I would caution against that. I, I, I would, I would shoot for the people, the percentage of people that want so problems solved that maybe go beyond usual and customary, because I think there's going to be plenty of those. And I think if you do that through good education, good training, and look at this as a marathon, not a sprint, I think we're going to be totally fine. And uh, this is the same message I give to my daughter, and I totally get it. It's stressful right now because, you know, for her, she was supposed to take boards last week. That didn't happen. You know, so mm. boards, finishing up requirements, licensure, all that stuff is kind of up in the air right now. So it's scary for those young dentists that are kind of waiting. But when you look back 20 years from now, it's probably going to be a speed bump. It's probably going to be a couple months one way or another. Uh, so you just have to kind of look at it from a big vision. And, and in this time, what I would say, as long as it goes on, just try to stay scheduled, you know, get up in the morning, don't sleep in and sleep the day away, get up, go for a walk, get some exercise, learn something every day, um, and just keep moving. Because if you just, and, and make on, and God, turn the news off, right? Don't, don't, <laughs> Don't watch the ticker tape go, for, you know, uh, so I mean, if we do that, I think you just stay positive. And, and, and I, by the way, I, I totally appreciate you doing a show like this because it's needed right now. We need some positive things to look at. I, I, I really appreciate that. And everybody I've spoken to, <clears throat> they've been so generous and gracious and, and awesome. And I have some really cool stuff uh, lined up. I will, um, and I do this with any, anyone from any institution that I do speak to, and I'm gonna talk to different people in different institutions. I will um, uh, put the link for Dawson Academy. Uh, yeah, on the, the, uh, yeah one, thing, one thing I will tell you all, <clears throat> and we announced this yesterday, is um, the entry level um, class that, that uh, we spoke about earlier, functional occlusion. It's now called Functional Occlusion 2020 and Beyond. It was completely revamped this year to look at our digital workflows and all. Uh, but that's a $1,700 class. That's tough right now. And we're going to live stream it on the 4th and 5th of May for $199. So wow. we're trying to get as many people uh, just to have access to this information. So if you could get that out there, that would be very helpful I to us. Yeah. Definitely can. If you can send me the information, yeah, I'll be I more will. than happy to put that on. And uh, this will go on my uh, YouTube channel as well. Perfect. Uh, well, I honestly, I cannot thank you enough. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate your, your passion in dentistry and your passion in teaching others. And like I said, being a true mentor and to myself and so many others. And, um, and what, how many, how many dogs do you have? I'm looking in the back. Is that, is that the only dog? Oh, dude. So we're, we're actually at our lake house. We've been here for five weeks. I've got my wife and three kids. And then I've, I've got three dogs and I got my grand cat and grand dog. So it's a little Dr. Doolittle-ish right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we have, nobody's killed each other yet. So it's a No, no. Answer. You know, I, I do follow you on Instagram and I see the lake and all of that. So you're having a, you're having a good time. And thank you again for everything that you do you are truly an inspiration and and i really really appreciate it so well i i appreciate you too and i remember you know meeting you all those years ago back in west palm we had some good times when i was coming down there we really had fun, some yeah. fun yeah, yeah 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 so uh thank you again and um have a great day and we're going to sign off and uh all right thanks one more thanks time. again for having me appreciate Not it a problem. Uh, functional occlusion is not just 28 unit cases. It affects everything that we do from the standpoint of the single composite, single crown, veneer cases, if you're doing your own Invisalign, restoring the worn dentition, all on four. But what I'm most excited about is this transition to digital. Our workflows have been really the same for a very, very long time uh, as we got advanced records and took face bows and poured models and mounted in centric relation. And it's been a dream of mine for a very long time to be able to digitize that workflow. And usually utilizing lab software, we can now scan them out, have it mounted on a virtual instrument in minutes and be able to visualize exactly the same things that we do on a regular instrument. Uh, we can't say that the stone age of dentistry is gone forever. Uh, there's still time to be working in an analog environment. But if you have interest in being able to do 
more long-lasting, functionally correct dentistry, dentistry that's beautiful, dentistry that will solve your patient's problem, dentistry that will allow you to be the go-to dentist in your community. Functional inclusion is a class that will definitely get that done for you.